Today I'm going to teach you about buck converters and show you how to make a switch mode power supply that can work with input voltages between 8 and 30 volts and it steps the output down to 5 volts. It can supply 3 amps continuously and it can handle peak currents of up to 5 amps for several minutes. Let's start with why we need switch mode power supplies in the first place. In previous videos I talked about linear voltage regulators like the LM7805 and LM317. These are really easy to use, but they're very inefficient at high voltages. For example, if you try to power a linear voltage regulator with 28 volts and had 5 volts and 3 amps on the output, you'd end up with 69 watts of heat produced, and that might cause a few problems with your circuit. For high-powered projects, you want to be using what is called a switch mode power supply. There are many different types of switch mode power supplies that can get you from one voltage to another, but today we're going to talk about buck converters, which is a type of supply that can step higher voltages down to lower voltages. Let's start with an input voltage of 10 volts, and let's put a switch in series with it. It doesn't matter what the switch is. It could be a bipolar transistor, a MOSFET, or even a crackhead mashing a mechanical switch. For efficiency reasons, you should use a MOSFET, but let's just use a generic switch symbol for now. Next, let's control the switch with a high-frequency pulse width modulated signal with a duty cycle of 50%. This will give us a square wave that's 10 volts half the time and 0 volts half the time. Now let's add an LC low pass filter. The inductor resists sudden changes in current and the capacitor resists sudden changes in voltage. The combined effect is that our LC low pass filter averages out the square wave and we get 5 volts of relatively steady DC on the output. Now unfortunately if you build this in real life this will happen. But why? Well, let's say the switch is closed, and our power supply is delivering some current. This means that current is flowing through this inductor. Now let's open the switch. Since current in an inductor cannot instantly change, this means that current is still flowing through the inductor, but this side of the inductor isn't connected to anything. So you get this huge mass of electrons building up here, creating a massive negative voltage spike. This voltage spike can reach hundreds or even thousands of volts, enough to blow up any switch you connect here. If you want more detail about this phenomenon, check out my video on inductive spiking. In that video, you'll learn that the solution to the problem is to add a diode. With the diode in place, now whenever you open the switch, current can flow in a nice complete path, and the voltage after the switch barely goes below zero. This is the classic buck converter configuration and you can use this basic circuit to step high DC voltages down to lower DC voltages in a much more efficient way than linear regulators. Now, in school, they might tell you that this formula will give you the duty cycle you need to get the output voltage you want. Unfortunately, in the real world, this is garbage. As soon as you start drawing a few amps from your power supply, the various non-ideal parts of the circuit will complicate things. You'll get power losses in your switch, your diode, and your inductor, and even your wires. It's also highly unlikely that your output current will stay exactly the same. The more current your load draws, the more the voltage will drop. So what we need is a system that can continually monitor the output voltage and adjust the pulse width accordingly. If you draw more current on the output, and the output voltage drops too low, increase the pulse width. If the output voltage gets too high, decrease the pulse width. And we have to do this within a fraction of a second, otherwise we could fry the thing we're trying to power. In other words, we need a closed loop control scheme with negative feedback. We can accomplish this by adding a feedback resistor network at the output, a ramp oscillator, and an error amplifier. We're also going to need a precision voltage reference and a suitable slope comp- Shut up! Okay, how about we make things easy? Texas Instruments has a portfolio of products called Simple Switchers. All the simple switcher products are practically idiot-proof, and all you have to do is add a diode, an inductor, and some capacitors. They take care of the complicated control electronics inside the chip. Let's use the adjustable version of the LM2678, and here's the circuit diagram. On the input, we have a large electrolytic capacitor in parallel with a ceramic capacitor, and this is necessary to ensure that the LM2678 can easily switch current from the input at very high speeds. If you don't have sufficient capacitance on the input, the parasitic inductance of your input power wires will limit the amount of current you can switch in every switching cycle, and the regulator just won't work. 
For the diode, when you're designing switch mode power supplies, you almost always want to use Schottky diodes. These have a lower forward voltage than regular silicon diodes, so they produce less heat, which is something you always have to worry about when you're working with high currents. I'll put links to the components in the video description section. This is a bootstrap capacitor, and it's used to help drive the switching transistor inside the LM2678. It can be 10 to 100 nanofarads, and it should be a ceramic capacitor with at least a 50 volt rating. On the output we have a combination of capacitors that will smooth out the high frequency content of the switching waveform, leaving you with relatively clean and stable DC. These resistors configure the LM2678 to give you a 5 volt output. Try to use 1% resistors if you want an accurate 5 volt output. Alright, let's build this thing. You don't want to use a breadboard for this. Use perfboard or make your own PCB. Solder in the LM2678 first, leaving a large amount of space around it to fit the other components. Solder in the input electrolytic capacitor within a centimeter or two of the controller, and use short, thick lines of solder to make the connections. Do the same with the diode and the output capacitor. Keep the component leads as short as possible. When you solder the feedback resistors, try to keep the wire going back to the chip as short as possible. The layout on the underside of the board is even more important than the top side. Notice how my ground is one continuous straight line, and I arranged all the components on the top side around this. I also soldered on a ground wire for oscilloscope probing later. And look how I soldered the ceramic input and boost capacitors directly across the pins of the LM2678. If these caps are even a few millimeters away from the chip, everything will perform a lot worse. Okay, now that everything's soldered up, I'm going to power my buck converter with 10 volts, and I'm going to use my programmable electronic load to see how it performs delivering different amounts of current. If you're doing this at home, you can just use 5 ohm 10 watt power resistors as a dummy load. First, let's check the output voltage is what we want it to be. And it is! Perfect 5 volts DC. Excellent. Now let's take a look at this node in the circuit, which is called the switching node. This is before the LC low pass filter. You can see our familiar 0 to 10 volt square wave, and the switching frequency is 250 kilohertz. But you can see the duty cycle is about 52% instead of the theoretical 50%. This is with a half amp load on the supply. If I increase the load to 3 amps, the duty cycle increases to 56%. And at 5 amps, the power losses are significant enough that the controller had to change the duty cycle to 61% to maintain the regulated 5 volt output. Remember when I said we were getting a perfect 5 volts? I lied. Let's change the coupling on the oscilloscope to AC coupling and zoom in. You can see that there's a small AC component on the output because our low pass filter isn't perfect. We call this the output ripple of the power supply because it looks like little wave ripples. We have about 20 millivolts of ripple and noise with a 3 amp load. If I increase the load to 5 amps, things get noisier. If I increase the input voltage to 28 volts, the ripple waveform gets bigger and it changes shape. Ideally, we want this ripple to be as small as possible. For most applications, under 100 millivolts peak to peak will be fine, but in general, you don't want to use switch mode power supplies to power sensitive circuits like radio receivers. If you want to learn more about measuring power supply ripple, enable video annotations and check out Dave Jones's excellent video on the subject. Now let's measure the efficiency of our supply and compare it to a linear voltage regulator. From a 28 volt input, my bench power supply is supplying 0.61 amps to our DC to DC converter. My multimeter says the output of the converter is 5.019 volts and I have the load set to exactly 3 amps. If you're doing this at home with resistors as a load, make sure you use your multimeter to accurately measure the output current. Here's the equation for power supply efficiency. Plugging in the values we measured earlier, we find that our power supply is around 88% efficient, which is pretty good. This is why people usually use switch mode power supplies for currents higher than 1 amp. Alright, now you know how to make a high current power supply, and knowing is half the battle. Thank you for watching, and if you like this video, please check out the video description section to see how you can support me. Make sure you check out Patreon, which is kind of like an ongoing Kickstarter campaign to help fund the channel.